Thank you. All. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I have to say that, that having uh, listened to various um, speeches this morning, I am struck by the diversity of approaches to, uh, by, by the different speakers. And I will try to contribute to this diversity by bringing my, my own different perspective on some of the issues that uh, you've been discussing. And I, it's, to me, it's extremely interesting that a Congress such as this one looks at real economy issues on how you can uh, basically go beyond some of the traditional questions that you ask in these situations and look at specific uh, cases and industries, uh, the, the green economy, education, entrepreneurship, tourism. And I will, as I said, and as Mark was kind enough to, to say in the beginning, I will bring two distinct perspectives, that of an ex-finance minister, and these types are a very particular breed, and that of an ex-minister of uh, environment and energy, and that's, again, a very different uh, perspective. And what I have chosen to speak on, and I wouldn't call it a lecture, it's more thoughts on, on where we are and where we should be going, is the concept of going from crisis to creativity. Because, and I will take my own country as an example, because everybody knows that Greece was and is in a crisis. It's not alone, it's part of a broader European crisis, uh, but we have kind of for many years monopolized the headlines as being the most serious case of a country in trouble in need of changing its ways and finding a new future. And I think exactly how you do that in a country that was in deep and continues to be in deep trouble uh, is, is a story that goes beyond Greece and has a lot to say about other uh, countries, not just in Europe, but, but beyond. So, Again, these two perspectives. The first one, from the uh, point of view of somebody who was called in 2009 to have the privilege, but also the heavy duty to uh, guide the, the economic policy of a country in its perhaps most difficult juncture since the Second World War. And uh, a time in which Greece found itself facing the repercussions of mistakes made over many, many years, even decades, that had to be dealt with now, immediately, in a very difficult way, faced with immediate bankruptcy, and having to take some very, very tough decisions. Uh, the country at that point was facing a multitude of deficits. The obvious ones were the fiscal deficit, 16% uh, of GDP, the second obvious one was a competitiveness deficit. The country was uh, importing uh, much more than it was exporting, had an external account deficit of 16%. But there were also other deficits. There was a credibility deficit. Nobody would believe what we were saying. And partly that had to do with our statistics and our data that were false. Uh, and some deeper deficits, institutional deficits, a broken social pact. Without it, you can't really move a country forward. When citizens don't trust their politicians, they don't trust uh, what's, ha what's happening. Therefore, they're not engaged. And also, a, a deficit uh, with our own productive system. We're producing the wrong things for the wrong markets. And therefore, we're completely out of tune with what was happening in the rest of the world. Now, this, this was obviously Greece's problems, but at the same time, uh, Greece's problems showed the broader European problems because the EU was caught uh, like a hair in front of the, of the, of the headlights. Uh, it wasn't expecting this to happen. It didn't have the tools to deal with it. It thought that in the Eurozone, everybody faces the same risk. Nobody's in danger of defaulting. Therefore, this, this problem shouldn't really arise, but it did. And when it did, everybody scrambled to find solutions. And the solutions were not there. We had to make them from scratch. And that was part of why this was such a dramatic period. So that's my first vantage point. My second one is a much more fun one. And that was uh, being in charge of the energy and environment agenda in Greece. And I say it's, it's a much more fun one because there you deal with, with the real economy. You deal with issues of how you can help push renewables and change your energy mix, how you can look and position your country in the, in the big geo 
political game of gas routes and whether you, you have any hope of your hydrocarbon potential just like Cyprus and, and Israel did. Or closer to home, uh, what do you do about the garbage? Uh, waste management issues, how do you push recycling, how do you um, uh, get a society which isn't used to this to, to change its ways and, and, and uh, create a whole industry out of it. And rather than sort of exporting your garbage, which is unfortunately what the country was doing, to think of, of, in, of innovative ways of, of uh, uh, using other people's garbage to generate energy or, or, or uh, wealth. So the challenge and I will try and use these two perspectives to, to, to address it, is uh, how do you take an economy, a country, which is in a deep morosity, where people have lost hope about their future, where, yes, after a lot of austerity and a lot of difficult decisions, after three to four years, you're running a balanced primary budget, meaning you're not spending more than you're earning. And you have finally have a balanced external account. But at the same time, you've lost a quarter of your GDP, a quarter, the biggest drop in any country since the US depression. You've got 29% unemployment. One, more than one in two people uh, below the age of 25 are out of work. And there is what I called before the, this broken social compact, meaning people just don't trust the political system, and this gives rise to the extremes. Uh, we have one of the biggest, unfortunately, Nazi parties in Europe at the moment uh, in, in you know, fighting elections. So how do you manage to rebrand the country to the outside world, but again instill into the citizens a belief that they actually live in a fantastic place, with a lot of potential, with great people, uh, which has been failed by its political system and its institutions, but which can actually, with a bit of help and a bit of work, manage to get out of it. And manage to get out of it with the help of its friends, with the help of 240 billion euro in bailout, in two bailout packages, with the help of the biggest dead haircut in global history, over 100 billion uh, debt, uh, but also with a very tough, with very tough creditors, uh, with people who have lent the country uh, huge uh, amounts of money, but also expect the country to continue changing, and will monitor that change, and will therefore make themselves very unpopular in Greece because they will ask for things which are often fought and debated and are difficult to accept by people who are used to work in a different way. So that's, that's, that's the environment within you, you, you're working, uh, that you're working with. And in that environment, you're trying to figure out a method. How do you do this? Do you come up with a big plan? Do you come up with a grand design that says, this is the 10-year plan for the country. This is where the country should be focusing on. It should be doing A, B, and C, and we're not going to put all our resources there. Or do you go a completely different way and work from the bottom up, looking at very specific uh, good stories, success stories, people who have, against the odds, managed to do something for themselves, who have um, you know, uh, uh, gotten up by pulling their bootstraps and, and managed to, to be successful, not just in Greece, but, but, uh, but internationally? The answer is, of course, you do a combination. You, you can't do only one thing. You, you, you try to have a combined approach, which has got to be long term. A country does not change from one day to the next. But has got to also show immediate results, because you need to show to people who are morose and disappointed and extremely unhappy and extremely pessimistic about the future that it, it won't always be like this. Uh, it's got to inspire. It's got to look at the unemployed young guy who thinks that there is absolutely no hope and show him that he cannot expect the state to give him a job. That's finished. He can't ex expect to be on the door all his life. Uh, but if he actually tries to take charge of himself, it's not going to be easy, but there will be uh, some potential for him. So 
if you look at the, new, at, the, at the big picture, because I think it's important to start with that, often people ask me, okay, fine, you know, you, you, you did a lot of the tough work. Greece is now uh, kind of uh, on a fisc in a fiscal sense much more responsible. But, you know, what will Greece produce in the years to come? What will a small country produce like that? How can you uh, sustain a livelihood in this country uh, which has no huge natural resources, except if we find huge quantities of oil and gas, uh, and uh, is a little bit outside the core of Europe. Uh, so what will you guys do? And this is not a question that is only about Greece. I was interested to hear before one of the questions uh, to uh, the Dutch speaker saying, you know, Netherlands, the Netherlands is a small country. What can it do? What can a small country what is the comparative advantage of a small country in the periphery of Europe? The answer is it's got some traditional comparative advantages, and it can't throw those out. Uh, and it's got to create new ones. And the traditional ones, well, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind, of course, is tourism. It's a beautiful country. Uh, culture. It's a country with heritage and history. Uh, and combining these in, in innovative ways, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll come to some examples in a moment, but then Obviously, these are important. We are rediscovering them now. Uh, we're expecting two and a half million German tourists this summer, for example. But that's not enough. You need to create new advantages because you can't simply rely on what you used to have, even if you rebrand these. And the new advantages can uh, span a very wide area. Thank God for the new technologies which allow a young person uh, in Athens to create an application which will be sold internationally and nobody will know where its maker resides or where he went to school. Uh, so anything from IT to logistics to health and education services for the broader area, you name it, the country could do it. So if you're trying to rebrand, you've got to somehow identify those kind of areas where you can potentially be good. And there's, there's no shortage of, of uh, uh, studies that have done that. There's, a, there's an excellent study by McKinsey, for example, which has looked at some of the key sectors which could drive growth in, in Greece in the next few years. Uh, I, I already mentioned tourism, but tourism in a different way, not your classic mass tourism, tourism which is often niche, which looks at high quality uh, services, Actually, in my family, we have a bit of, uh, of a uh, focus on that as my wife writes travel books for small, interesting hotels in, in Greece. You have energy, uh, where you have, obviously, the sun and the wind. But then again, there, if you overdo it, or if you have the wrong incentives in place, you end up with footing a bill to push solar energy, uh, which becomes unsustainable. Just like in Germany, you, they have, the government has seen and has had to cut subsidies for solar panel produ solar producers, not solar panel producers, but solar uh, uh, energy producers. Uh, you've had the same problems in Greece. You've got aquaculture. Those of you that don't like salmon, but like Mediterranean fish, which is infinitely better, will probably be eating Greek fish. We are the biggest fish farming country in Europe. Uh, by far, and uh, it's more likely that if you buy uh, sea bass or some similar Mediterranean fish, it's Greek. Uh, specialty foods, uh, we like to think that uh, there is no better honey in the world than Greek thyme honey, same with yogurt. Uh, but again, you've got to market it, because uh, in the US, the great success story was Greek style yogurt, uh, by Chobani, a manufacturer which had nothing to do with Greece, but was using a Greek word and the Greek heritage to produce and conquer the market, while the real Greek producers of real Greek uh, sorry, uh, yogurt were sleeping. So you may have the comparative advantage, but not be using it. Um, generic pharmaceuticals, an area where you have some great companies that are manufacturing generics, much cheaper than the, the, uh, the ones produced by, the, by Big Pharma. And uh, with a increased demand throughout the world, generics is uh, the fastest growing type of pharmaceuticals worldwide. Uh, hub of logistics, we happen to be in a conference in a, in a 
in a geographical area that links uh, a number of different continents. Uh, one of the biggest Chinese investments in Europe is actually in the port of Piraeus, which is being used now as a hub uh, to send uh, into uh, Northern Europe uh, products uh, shipped in from China, as well as other things which people think less of, for example, medical tourism or education services. Now, I know there's some Greeks in the audience. To think of Greek education as an export is sometimes difficult to comprehend. But actually, you have some, I taught a postgraduate course in a Greek university where most of the students were Indian, who had decided to find a university in Europe uh, dealing with e-policy, uh, dealing with how uh, policy changes if you think of it in a digital environment. So loads of opportunities. So the question is, how do you get these, how do you get these off the ground? How do you manage to pass from a grand plan and a design where you think, oh, here are my 10 sectors? And to, and to be able to answer the question, you have got to think of three prerequisites. One is people, the second is money, and the third is the broader environment. Let's take each of these in turn. People. If you walk around Berlin, uh, you will stumble upon a shop called Kokomat. Kokomat is a Greek company with shops all over the world, including in China. They sell mattresses. Those of you that have, uh, it's, they're not cheap. Uh, those of you that uh, have the pleasure of sleeping on Kokomat mattresses, they're natural fiber. Uh, they are, they're now sold in the Hilton chain internationally, will be amazed about how a very simple idea by a guy who had absolutely nothing to do with mattresses when he started it, uh, has managed to, be, to become a global brand uh, that basically capitalized on the need throughout the sort of advanced world for a new type of uh, mattress which is based on uh, pure ingredients and natural fibers. Uh, the company is now gone beyond mattresses and is looking at a whole way of life, basically. It, it's, it's branded itself as a lifestyle company. So a person who just decided to start something from scratch and managed to make something very unique out of it. Cores, Masticha shop. People who took very simple ingredients in the Greek countryside, masticha being uh, from the masticha tree, which is the basis for chewing gum, and created cosmetics out of that and are selling these worldwide. Companies such as, because I don't want to only stay within sort of the natural elements of, uh, of that you find, but companies like Pharmaten or uh, Raycap, Raycap, a fantastic company in the north of Greece, which makes emergency switches for in, in order to secure communications in airports throughout the world. They're selling, they're exporting 100% of their manufacturing, and they have managed to get contracts from JFK International in New York and airports throughout the United States and be basically their security backbone in, in case other systems fail. So very high tech and in very difficult markets. Uh, a company called Persado, internet company, which basically uh, looks at big data and tries to unlock the DNA of selling online, being funded now by some very big US funds. So, you know, the ideas are there. The people are there. These people manage to overcome tremendous difficulties and go from nothing to make a, a company which can stand worldwide. But you can't simply rely on you know, having uh, people whose uh, DNA and urge uh, is, is, is enough to be able to overcome these difficulties. Somehow you need to support these people. And how do you do it? Well, you do it with money, and you do it with an environment that doesn't stifle this kind of creativity and innovation, but actually helps it. Money. Well, anyone who knows how and has sort of looked at how you take a, an idea and turn it into a global company 
knows the difficulty that we have, not just in Greece, but in Europe more generally, to do exactly that. How many Facebooks are there in Europe? How many Microsofts or Apples were born in Europe? It's no accident that they were born where they were born. You have a whole institutional design to deliver capital in an environment that is conducive in the US that you do not have in Europe, much less in Greece. So it is, and if you look in, in the Greek case, you see a banking system that has no money to give, and foreign capital looking at the country and thinking, hmm, maybe the political risk is still too high. So it is urgent in this case to be able to not just have 10 good examples for somebody like me, to come up again and again, because if you if you hear to talks like this, you will see the same 10, 20 companies being mentioned. So how do you go beyond that and you nurture this, this, these guys to actually be able to grow, but also many others? You need to create this microcosm of financing, which the US is doing so well with angel networks, venture capital uh, firms, uh, and to create it and put it in place in a place like Greece, as well as broadly, more broadly in Europe, because we're failing in Europe as a whole on this one. And finally, uh, and in this context, of course, you can, you can think of public money helping. The EIB, the European Investment Bank, and the European Investment Fund have some great new tools, like the Jeremy Funds, which help such companies. But these are very few, and they can only be an addendum to basically j help the global capital pool uh, focus on specific areas, specific countries. Finally, the broader environment. Money is all very well if you can get it. But for these companies and for ideas to be able to be translated into successful companies, you need some things which we got badly wrong in Greece. You need a stable, clear tax environment. You need a functioning public sector. And more to the point, apart from these kind of macro-institutional things, you need some cultural traits which until now have not been there in Greece. Again, the, 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 the Dutch speaker before uh, mentioned something which I, I think was, is very important, which is true for the whole of Europe, but is also very true for Greece, which is the fear of change. The lack of a positive attitude towards risk-taking. And unfortunately, in Europe in general, but perhaps even more in my country, it is not only lacking, but we seem to be taking steps backwards. You see it in the political world in terms of people's attitudes towards Europe making the necessary next steps to integrate more, to open more to people from outside Europe. Uh, you see it reflected in some electoral uh, results and the rise of extreme parties that are xenophobic. Uh, that uh, uh, fear immigration, that, that want to close Europe rather than open it, want to close nations rather than open it. And you see it within individual countries with the way that we kill every new innovation, we kill every new entrepreneur, we put all sorts of obstacles. Rather than embracing them, rather than making their life easy, we make it difficult. So I have no answer to how you can change this from one day to the next. It's, it's, it's a cultural trait, and it's part of what makes Europe and the U.S. has it in a different way because it's part of what made the U.S. the U.S. But this is something we need to work on. And uh, we need to work by example. We need to work by changing our education system, by being much more afraid of an open education system that is uh, uh, willing to give uh, chances to people who, wouldn't, who haven't necessarily gone to a good school, who don't have the right connections, and who were not born with money in the first place. So let me close with some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, you know, there's a great expression, which is, it's a shame to waste a good crisis. And it's very true. We, we've gone in Europe, and certainly in my country, through an extremely traumatic period where we've had to reevaluate many things. And uh, there's two ways of approaching this. One is to basically convince yourself that you know you reach the peak and you basically it's all downhill from here uh, all you will have to do is manage your current environment and salvage whatever you can to me this is this it's a disastrous choice 
uh, Europe, and I think that within Europe, my own country, has tremendous potential in terms of its people, its abilities, its, uh, uh, its place in the world. But to be able to realize the potential, it's got to take the crisis and, as the uh, phrase has it, turn into an opportunity. But to do, that, to do that, it's got to take some pretty courageous decisions. And some of these decisions are purely political, and some of these decisions are, have to do with people's mindsets and changing those. And I hope that this uh, uh, event today is going to have a, a very small uh, contribution in that direction. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your very interesting lecture and for giving us your insight also from, from Greece. I'm sure this has provoked some questions. I can give you the microphone. So. Um, hello, my name is Ricardo Burgos. I'm from Puerto Rico. And um, I hear your story, and uh, we're going through the exact same thing as we speak, maybe not as chaotic as it has been in, in we don't have that higher that high of unemployment and many other aspects, but it's very similar and the challenges are the same. I have, I have, I'm very curious about, um, if you know about something I wanna read very briefly. Um, Annette Hauser, she's, um, she wrote this, the way we rate national economies is all wrong, says rating agency reformer Annette Hauser with mysterious and obscure methods. Three private US-based credit rating agencies wield immense power over national economies across the globe, and the outcomes can be catastrophic. But what if there was another way? In this bold talk, uh, Hauser shares her vision for a nonprofit agency that will bring more equality and justice uh, into the mix. I don't know if you know about her. I don't know. If, what, what are your thoughts about the uh, rating agencies? OK. Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch three guys that I got to know on a first-name basis uh, during the crisis. Uh, these are the people who, a few days before Enron in the US collapsed, were giving it AAA, the best and safest investment. So they got it badly wrong. They also kept giving Greece a very high rating. And as a result, the markets were lending to Greece at basically about the same interest rates that they were lending to Germany, which, if you look back on it, just does not make any sense. <laughs> These people, once they realized that, oops, you know, it's not like that, they went the exact opposite way. And they were in a race between themselves to sort of correct their mistake by downgrading Greece and other peripheral countries uh, and to see who could do it the fastest. So this is by no means an objective mechanism which really looks at the country's potential and gives the right signal to the market. Unfortunately, if you're a 23-year-old trader sitting in a desk in London with your finger on the button of a buy or sell of a Greek government security, uh, the only information you look at is this. You don't go bother to look behind the lines. All you look is at, is at you know, the Reuters flashing, Reuters flashing on your screen <laughs> cell, you know, the, the Greek economy downgrade again, and you press the sell button. And this has a disastrous effect for any economy. OK, now let's all agree that this is very bad. The question is, what do you do about it? I have a lot of. Sympathy for the criticism, because I felt it in my skin. But I have, at the same time, a lot of uh, difficulty in accepting easy alternative solutions, such as creating a nonprofit that does the same work. I am more inclined to say that we need to regulate these guys better, have them more transparency in how they do their work, uh, and uh, maybe look at what they can and what they cannot do. Because rating economies is completely different from rating corporates. They got the wrong of the corporates as well. But that's, that's a problem for the corporates. If you rate economies, it's a problem for the whole country. So 
The European Commission has, has started in 2010, uh, partly because we, we were yelling murder, uh, uh, started to look into these things. There were some big pronouncements uh, by the German Chancellor and others saying, you know, we have to look at these agencies because clearly they're manipulating the market at the end of the day. You know, a lot of people are making money as a result of this. Uh, not much has happened, unfortunately. And there is a danger here that now that we think that the crisis is almost over, you know, we're back on track. Uh, we're back sort of business as usual, which is a broader lesson, unfortunately, has to do with the banking system more, more broadly as well. We think we've solved the issue relating to the financial system in Europe. We have not. Okay? And we think that the crisis is over. It has not. It's in a lull. If something goes wrong in one country, it is not hard for it to come all over again. They will be all surprised again. Because, and, and this has to do, of course, with the political cost in many countries of taking very difficult decisions. Just like in Greece, we have the political cost of sort of curtailing expenditures. In the same way, in, in countries such as Germany, the Netherlands, or Finland, uh, you have a huge political cost of saying things which are not terribly nice to hear for your electorate, which is that actually a creating a mechanism to mutualize risk in Europe is not something that has to do with solidarity. It's actually something, with, have something that has to do with the stability of the financial system. You need to do it for stability, not because you want to be nice to those guys in the South. Okay? But that's a very hard message to put across. And my fear is that as you get closer to elections, as we are to European Parliament elections now, uh, where politicians retreat to safe ground, and they don't want to say things which are potentially politically difficult for them in the polls, all this is going to be forgotten until after the European Parliament elections. And then we'll see what kind of European Parliament we have and will it be able to move in this direction or not. So uh, I'm not very optimistic in terms of the credit rating agencies or more reform in the banking sector. Some steps have been taken, but not enough. Uh, thanks for the talk, first of all. My name's uh, Luke. I was wondering, what do you believe are the prospects of Europe becoming more innovative when the European Union still devotes most of its resources to programs such as the Common Agricultural Policy? <laughs> thanks. Are you French? English. English Thank sorry. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Common Agricultural Policy and its huge percentage of the European uh, community budget has of course to do with the fact that some countries, France is an obvious one, uh, have flatly refused to uh, move resources away from supporting uh, their agriculture to areas that badly need support. So the uh, the quick answer to your question is not very, not very optimistic because we, you know, agriculture funds for agriculture policy is are still what 40, 50 percent of the total European budget. Yeah, I think budget, I think it's half. Right, uh, and we haven't been able to make a dent at that. While the share of agriculture in European GDP has been falling, the share of number of people engaged in agriculture has been falling, and yet the subsidies remain as high as they were. And by the way, uh, I think that those high subsidies are also a, an affront to countries outside Europe, okay, who should be allowed to export more towards Europe and are not because we are artificially creating uh, and sustaining an, uh, an agricultural environment which is non-sustainable. Now, some countries within Europe have managed to get this right. The Netherlands has managed to have a very robust agricultural sector, which is competitive because it has gone into niche markets and does unique things. So I, at the same time as I'm very critical of the fact that we've been very reluctant to shift our priorities within uh, the European Union, at the same time, I do not think that that is the biggest problem because I do not think that the lack of innovativeness in Europe has simply got to do with how you spend the 1% of the European budget of the European, of the 
Europe-wide GDP, which is the budget, on different priorities. I think it's, it's a much broader issue. It's got to do with how our universities are structured. It's got to do with the relationship between universities and industry. It's got to do with the lack of venture capital financing. A whole host of other things that go way beyond simply EU financing. I'm not saying that it wouldn't help to finance more uh, the interesting stuff and the innovative stuff. But I am saying that even if you shifted 20% of the common agricultural policy to that, if you didn't change the other, the other things, the other parameters, you wouldn't be making a dent. There may be a final question. As I don't have so much of a question rather than a comment, perhaps you would like to ask your question. I can make my comment in the end. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ioana, Ioana Tom. I come from Greece. Um, I will not speak as a lawyer. I will uh, actually would like to make a comment as a Greek citizen who benefited quite a bit from my Greek education. Um, I think the cultural traits you refer to are very important. I would like to add a few in the list of things you mentioned. I think one first important bit is that Greece needs to become more meritocratic. The second thing is that Greek citizens need to learn to be individually responsible and through that build collective conscience, which we don't have. And the third one is that we will need to get rid of big ideas. I think that when it comes to survival, economically speaking, it's important to have big ideas. But I come from um, a zone which is focusing on innovation and technology. Um, it is, Greece has the possibility to do great things in this field, but it will start from making modifications, applications, new derived products out of existing successes and make these products uh, commercially uh, viable. Then, once one builds a certain level playing field in that sort of market, this brings momentum. And then new big ideas may be generated, which actually could make big companies in the long run. But I think that from a strategic point of view, it makes more sense to start thinking more lower level and then try to capitalize as much as one can with a little bit of patience. The other two, though, cultural traits are important for the third one to happen. Thank you. A quick comment to your comment. Uh, I fully agree with the first two points. I think it's been part of our problem as a nation that we have not been able to tackle uh, those two. On the third point, I think it's a case a little bit more of letting a thousand flowers bloom. In a previous life as an economist, before I, I got into politics, I, I was working in the economics of innovation. And there, of course, a, the biggest part of innovation is the incremental changes, adapting, improving. And that's the easy way in, of course. Uh, at the same time, you know, if you've got somebody who's got a brand new big idea, just give them the means to try it on, to try it. You know, the, the world is out there. Uh, and if you are engaged and uh, confident and willing, you can probably find financing. You can probably find your place. There's enough tools nowadays to be able to jump on the global bandwagon. And if your idea is good enough, great. So yes, on the general principle. Um, but I don't think we should set limits to ourselves. I don't think that that's what the current environment requires. I'm not saying that, that you're saying this as a, as a national strategy, but I am saying that you could, because out of this difficult Greek education system, uh, you, you'd still have diamonds that can produce great stuff. You still have great professors, you still have great students, and you have people who uh, finish a mediocre university and then uh, immediately get funding from a US uh, venture capital firm and set up in uh, the Silicon Valley, and next thing you know, they've got a company which is doing very well. So. Uh, let's, let's look at these people and bring them out as, as role models, as they are, uh, and show them out to the Greek society and help, in that way, get rid of the first two traits. 
I would like to ask one more question out of pure cu curiosity, and it is the transition of decision making within, I don't know what the average age is in the, in the people that make decisions in Greece, and how are they allowing the new generations to become part of that transition? In, in my case in Puerto Rico, it's really hard. Uh, I, I'm 40 years old, and uh, it's really uh, difficult to influence the old school guys, and, 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 and that has a lot of repercussions. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. V very interesting question. Uh, I, I saw the other day, a, uh, in, a, in a magazine, a, a ranking of ages. Just to, it plays exactly into your question. The two oldest prime ministers in Europe at the moment are the Greek and the Cypriot one. The youngest is the, the new Italian prime minister, Matteo Renzi. Uh, we are a society where to get anywhere, you need to be older and that younger people are just not given the... But this is not, it's not surprise. It's because it's not a society based on meritocracy. It's a society based on who you know and how you get on to life because of people that you know. And if you're not, you know, 55, nobody will look at you. If you're a 35-year-old who wants to do politics, they'll say, well, you know, you're too young. Certainly if you're 25-year-old. If you're a 30-year-old who wants to do some great business, they'll say, well, you're probably too young. You have to wait. So, yes, the, the barriers are there, and it's a whole way of structuring society. I, I have the feeling, and I hope, I don't know if it's more of a hope than a, than a, a real reading of the situation, that this is slowly changing, that you do get more opportunities for younger people, because at the same time, you have a rejection of the old. You know, people say, we're fed up with all of you guys. We want some new faces. But it's not so easy because the same people who will say that will then go and vote for the old guys. Uh, and they will not give the time of day to a new person. So uh, it, it, it's much harder than you think. But I think that's a, a, a real problem in the country, yes. Okay, well, on that note, I think we need to bring the conclusion uh, to the discussion, but we're very, very grateful for the excellent keynote address, and thank you also very much for taking the time to respond to the questions and the discussion that follows. So if everyone could please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to Mr. George Papakotsundu. Thank you.